Hello, everyone. My name is Rob Kislev. I'm the chair of the Greater Auburn Area Fire Safe Council. The, the mission of the Fire Safe Council is to promote fire safe practices through outreach, education, uh, program development, and identify ways to protect the community from wildfire. We focus on the areas of Bowman, the city of Auburn, Newcastle, and Penryn. So I want to welcome everyone to our monthly educational forum. Today, our speaker is um, Cordy Craig. Um, Cordy has been working as the conservation project coordinator at the Placer Resource Conservation District for nearly two years. Her role at the RCD spans several different projects, including writing and editing the Forest Land Steward Newsletter, assisting the director, uh, excuse me, the district forester with large shaded field breaks and developing and expanding the prescribed burn program. She has also secured funding to start the Placer Prescribed Burn Association earlier this year. Before joining the RCD team, Cordy's received her MS in soil ecology and worked as a wildland firefighter in Colorado and Nevada. We'll have a Q&A session after the presentation, so if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat or the Q&A section during the session. And with that, I believe we can get started. Welcome, Cordy. Hey Rob, thank you so much for the introduction and also thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to present. So just give me one moment to try to share okay. my screen. All right. Are we all, we can all see it? I can see it, Cordy. Perfect. All right. So um, again, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk about the expansion of the prescribed burn program at Placer RCD. Um, as Rob mentioned, my name's Cordy. I've been there for about two years. Um, but so before I get into some of the specifics of uh, the Placer County or Placer RCD program, um, I'd just like to go over a little bit of the history of why fire is such an important tool um, for our forests. And so, um, as many of us probably know, we live in a fire dependent ecosystem. And what that means is that uh, the plants, animals, and, and humans have evolved and co-adapted to live with low intensity fire um, to maintain sustainability. And so um, we've been visibly seeing huge changes in the makeup of our forests over the last 100, 150 years. And those changes are due to a combination of climate change um, the forced removal of indigenous uh, tribes who have actively managed this land, as well as uh, fire suppression policies. And so um, the big one that I'll touch on is these fire suppression policies uh, were enacted um, after the great fires of 1910. Uh, this was a huge fire that burned more than 3 million acres throughout Montana and Idaho um, and had triggered a the suppression of fire um, through the US Forest Service. And um, they triggered policies such as the 10 a.m. rule in which uh, fire suppression agencies were strongly encouraged if not forced to eliminate any ignitions by 10 a.m. the next morning. Um, and these changes are, are very visible um, just from photographic evidence. And so I'll just go through a series of photos, um, this first one, uh, shows a forest uh, in 1909. It's a Western forest. These were taken from the Bitterroot. Um, and we're seeing this really open herbaceous understory, um, large vigorous trees. We can see about a uh, quarter, half mile in front of us. 30 years later, this is 1948. Um, we're no longer seeing that herbaceous understory. Instead, it's, it's covered with needle cast, leaf litter, and duff. Uh, we're starting to see a lot more understory growth. Even just 10 years later, 1958, um, we're starting to see a lot more dead and down trees. Um, more shade tolerant species are coming up. I can uh, identify a couple of cedars, firs in the background, um, and we can no longer see more than a hundred, couple hundred feet in front of us. And then even just 10 years later, I would say even 1968 looks a little bit better than 1958, but that's probably due to logging. Um, and we're getting a ton of fuels on the ground. Um, but I think the, the hardest part about this was when I was making this presentation, um, the 1968 photo, I looked at it and I was like, you know, that's actually not that bad. And I think that's because uh, what I'm really used to seeing, um, especially with some of the fuel breaks that we've worked on 
And when we go out to recreate in the woods, um, we're used to seeing forests that look a lot more like this. And so the current state of our forests are incredibly overcrowded and dense. Um, and there are just too many straws in the ground. So if we think about it as if, you know, we're having a milkshake um, at our favorite ice cream store, uh, that milkshake lasts a lot longer when it's just us drinking it. When we start sharing with one, two, three of our friends, that milkshake no longer lasts as long. And so that's a, a comparable analogy to what our forests are going going through. There's there's way too many trees um, and there's just not enough resources to uh, to sustain all of them. And, and what this means is that uh, they're incredibly vulnerable to any type of disturbance, um, high severity fire being one of them, pests and diseases, uh, they're not resilient to drought. And um, in addition to that, uh, we're getting these really deep duff layers that not only restrict native plant growth and diversity, but also restrict the infiltration of any precipitation that we do get. And so as we're starting to see um, with climate change, we're starting to see precipitation come more in the form of rain rather than snow. Um, it's important that we take advantage of that. And so uh, we've been really fortunate to have uh, somewhat of a cool August. And um, I was out in the field a couple of weeks ago during one of those little uh, spit storms and I could hear the rain, uh, but I couldn't feel it. And that was just a really um, important moment and powerful moment because the canopy is just so thick that even if, um, even if it does rain, it's rarely making it through the canopy. When it does make it through the canopy, we have these really thick duff layers that are preventing that water from entering the soil. So again, um, I identified that uh, with all of, these, all of these trees in the ground, um, it's creating a huge increase in competition and it's all, also really increasing tree mortality. And so I know that many of us maybe have driven north on 49 or out through Forest Hill. Um, and we've seen this firsthand. There's large patches of, of bug kill. Um, and this table is from the California Tree Mortality Task Force, and it's a little bit outdated. Um, but I've looked at some of the current numbers and, and they are increasing um, as far as tree mortality. Um, there are programs at the RCD, if you're interested, that address some of the tree mortality, but I won't go into those. Um, and so what I thought was interesting about this was a recent paper actually came out um, from the Stevens Lab in Forest Ecology and Management. And what they identified was that um, really in high intensity fire behavior that uh, was observed at the 2020 Creek Fire um, was not predicted by their fire behavior models. And part of the factors that influenced that high intensity fire behavior was the extensive tree mortality from bark beetle. And so being able to address um, tree mortality and make our forests healthier and, and improve all around forest stewardship um, can help ameliorate a lot of uh, these, these catastrophic fires that we're experiencing. So I promise that um, I'm going to get into uh, solutions very soon. This is probably the last of my really depressing slides, but um, this, the combination of, of climate change, of forest mismanagement, and the lack of fire on the landscape uh, has led to um, a scenario where we're experiencing really devastating fires that are completely out of our control to suppress. And so what I encourage folks to maybe rethink is that let's start to steward our lands a lot better and manage our lands, take care of the fuels problem and what is in our control. Um, and, and hopefully that will help with suppression as well when these fires do start. So in response to a lot of these devastating fires, uh, the governor came up with his uh, California Wildfire and Forest Resilience Task Force. This task force um, came up with several working groups that all address different um, parts of forest stewardship and, and community resilience in relation to wildfires. Um, and I'm not going to go through this whole flow chart, but what is important to acknowledge is um, that a lot of these working groups are, are coming up with solutions. Um, and with those solutions come a lot of funding that end up trickling down to um, organizations such as the RCD that start to do a lot more action-oriented implementation. One of those working groups with the uh, Wildfire Forest Resilience Task Force, Task Force is associated with the use of prescribed fire. 
And so I took this from um, a recent publication from that uh, working group called California's Strategic Plan for Expanding Beneficial Fire. Um, and what I wanna en uh, emphasize is just that it takes all of us um, to start to improve uh, California's state of affairs right now. And often that comes in much more localized and regional groups. And so um, that we have come up with these annual targets for prescribed fire and those include state agencies and federal agencies. Um, but we are, the RCD functions under more of this other land managers category. Um, and that could include tribal groups, uh, cultural fire practitioners and private landowners or prescribed burn associations, which I'll all go into later in this presentation. Um, and it's just important to emphasize that all of us can um, and are capable of, of playing a role in the solution. So, and a lot of the reason that we are emphasizing um, the use of prescribed fire and that there's a lot of government funding going into expanding the use of prescribed fire um, is that we acknowledge that we messed up, right? So our forests have not been appropriately managed for about 100, 150 years. Um, this photo uh, demonstrates after a large wildfire, uh, three different treatments. One, with, uh, one part of the forest was not treated at all. Um, another forest, another part of it was thinning only, and then this central part was thinning and prescribed fire. Um, I do apologize in advance. I do not know the source of this photo. I tried to look for it. Uh, my friend had sent it to me, and I just thought it was very powerful. So I apologize. I don't know where it was taken from. Um, but it does emphasize, and we've been seeing over and over again, um, that the combination, that we need a combination of thinning and prescribed fire to return our forest back to um, a healthy state. And so we can see that in the no treatment area, the fire completely decimated it. In the thinning only, I would argue it still completely decimated it because now we're left with a lot of really uh, high tree mortality that needs to be taken care of at some point. Um, whereas in the center, we see this uh, combination of thinning and prescribed fire has, the fire clearly went through, but uh, very much improved um, forest resilience. So I also love this photo. This is taken um, from a project in Colfax from before my time at the RCT, but the RCD was involved. Um, and it was a forest that has been managed using prescribed fire. And so we're seeing this really open herbaceous understory. Um, the trees are really well spaced. And I think you'll probably recognize this photo because it very much reflects um, this photo from 1909. And so, it's important to recognize that we can return to these historical levels of implementing prescribed burns and these um, historical uh, state of forest stewardship. Um, it's very possible, but it does require everybody working on it. So um, there's basically a buildup of work to do and, and it requires all hands on deck. And so that leads me to this expansion of uh, community-based burning efforts. So um, Len Quinn Davidson and Jeff Stackhouse of the UC Extension up in Humboldt um, have uh, started this um, and really progressed this effort of increasing the number of prescribed burn associations and community-based burning efforts throughout the state. Um, the Placer PBA formed earlier this year uh, after securing a little bit more funding from CAL FIRE. And we're seeing a ton of success with these groups um, and that private landowners are very capable and really good at putting um, safe, legal and ecologically beneficial fire on the ground. Um, and this is just one of the success stories. So um, some of you may have seen this video already. It's really powerful. If you haven't, I encourage you to look it up. Um, PBS did a story uh, a few months ago um, where they interviewed one of the landowners up in Plumas County. He was a landowner that lived in Greenville, California, one of the towns that was very much devastated by the Dixie Fire uh, last year. And this landowner was a part of the Plumas Underburn Cooperative, which is a really successful uh, prescribed burn association based out of Quincy. Um, and what he, what he did was he has been managing his land for the last few years, all community led, um, has, has put good fire on the ground himself. Um, and when the Greenville fire or when the Dixie fire came through, um, his structure was spared and his property was spared. 
And that's not only important uh, as far as an economic benefit for the community, but it's also really important for um, forest stewardship, for wildlife, for native plants. Um, he's essentially created a biodiversity lifeboat for that area. So um, his trees now have potentially could uh, uh, produce more seeds that could help reforest it, um, as well as creating browsing ground for wildlife or a safe haven for, for wildlife going through the area. And so all of this is to say, uh, is just to say that this has, information has influenced um, the prescribed burning on private lands program. So about two years ago, CAL FIRE, uh, provided the RCD with funding uh, to identify barriers to and solutions for increasing the pace and scale of prescribed burning in Placer County. And this has been an incredibly important partnership uh, between the United Auburn Indian Community, Todd's Valley, Miwok Maidu Cultural Foundation, NRCS, and the Placer County Air Quality Control District. So all of these agencies have provided a lot of support um, to the RCD's efforts of increasing pace and scale and training a lot of folks in Placer County um, to put more fire on the ground. And so I will um, kind of walk you through this little bit of a noisy graphic, um, but overall the graphic is just trying to identify where this program um, succeeds the most and kind of uh, how the RCD has found its niche um, in Placer County and helping to implement more prescribed burns. So on the y-axis, we have several different factors that influence the complexity of a prescribed burn. Um, that could include uh, topography, any type of preparation, uh, values at risk, if there are structures or anything in the unit. Um, and then on the x-axis, we have just this simple uh, spectrum of complexity, ranging from very low to very high. And what we're trying to demonstrate here is that private landowners really, um, really shine in this very low to low complexity um, framework of prescribed burning where we can essentially take advantage of a lot of these postage stamps of properties that have done um, really good uh, unit prep. So they've reduced their ladder fuels. Um, they've reduced a lot of the fuels on the ground. They've removed them. Um, they've conducted the prep. Uh, they're burning during the winter seasons. Um, and we can take advantage of these uh, private landowners also uh, benefit because they don't function under the same agency restrictions. So there's a lot less red tape. There's a lot less bureaucracy that's restricting their spontaneity. So um, often a lot of the complaints with prescribed fire is validly the weather and the weather's hard to come by and the weather happens on weekend. The, the good window happens on a weekend or the good window happens after working hours. And um, this is where private landowners can take advantage of that type of spontaneity and, and you know, call their neighbor up and ask for help and, and burn a quarter acre even. Um, and we're, we're starting to see that happen. The issue is that the primary barrier that um, landowners have identified to the RCD is that they, I, they know that prescribed fire is good. Um, they're really excited about the application of fire, but they feel that they lack the knowledge, skills, and confidence to do it safely. And so what the RCD has done in response is sought out funding to help um, train and provide workshops that emphasize on the ground implementation um, and to help landowners apply safe, legal and ecologically beneficial fire. So these workshop topics range from liability, uh, acquiring and abiding by the appropriate permits. Um, and we also have a strong emphasis on the ecological benefits of fire. So if fire is applied in a way that is, is way too hot and you end up killing a bunch of trees, really um, you're just mimicking wildfire conditions. And, and that's not what prescribed fire is all about. And so we try to train um, landowners to understand the native plant responses to fire, which plants can handle a little bit more heat than others, um, and also start to mimic this historical application of fire where we can get um, those forests that I demonstrated earlier with that beautiful spacing, um, really, uh, really good native plant stewardship. Um, and so what we emphasize is low, slow, and readily controlled. And so we did a pilot year last year, um, and I guess I'll toot the RCD's horn a little bit. We got really positive reviews from the landowners. Um, 
And I'll just read, read this really briefly. So after burning three acres with his family and community, one lander reached out and stated, I would not have the confidence to pull off any of this off without the RCD. And I'm so grateful I was able to attend. Um, great job providing a comprehensive picture of the legal landscape, safe burning conditions, and the plethora of positive outcomes that result from fire. Um, and then I did two small burns alone. I was pretty nervous at first, but the workshop and written materials prepared me to have a safe and low intensity burn. I'm excited uh, to use prescribed burning as a tool on my land and teach others. And what this emphasizes is just that uh, what the RCD is really focused on is ensuring that the knowledge that we are providing is leading to action because the only way that we can actually um, start to encourage the state to get back to a, a state of homeostasis um, and start to, to at least um, mitigate some of these uh, really catastrophic fires is by putting prescribed fire back on the ground. It's one thing to know about it, it's another to apply it. Um, and we also had uh, one very significant success story that um, I will emphasize, and that's that a landowner who attended one of our prescribed uh, burn workshops in November of 2021, um, ended up burning nearly 50 acres himself um, with his community, with the help of his community and with the help of the Prescribed Burn Association up in Nevada County um, in really small units, small and um, digestible units. And uh, so we obviously do not anticipate anybody that attends to our workshop to end up burning nearly 50 acres. But again, it all depends on the confidence of the landowner and the ability to understand the conditions around them to apply um, safe and beneficial fire. And so, although he's um, put about 50 acres of good fire on the ground, um, I've also heard of other landowners putting just a quarter acre, half acre, three acres on the ground, and all of those are successes. All of those are leading um, to better community resilience. And with that, I would, I would add that we've had no financial damages and no escapes. Um, and I think that's really powerful to emphasize is that private landowners can do this and they can do it right. Um, and so the RCD is really excited to announce that we just found out last week that in addition to the CAL FIRE funding, we also just got um, a, a national grant for about $75,000 um, from COCO, which is a Colorado-based organization called Coalitions and Collaboratives. And what this funding will help do is supplement um, our workshops. So we're hoping to ramp up uh, the workshops and demonstration burns that we're able to help landowners um, train. It also provides a little bit more money and equipment um, for our prescribed burn association. The RCD is hoping to uh, provide an, a community library, a community equipment library for landowners to borrow um, tools so that they can safely put fire on the ground. Um, and it also has helped us create this burn permit subsidy program. And so what we're aiming to do with that is folks who have attended our workshops or who will attend our workshops um, are welcome to apply for a 50% cost share option for burn permits. Um, and so more details on that uh, to come. Since we just found out we got the funding, we're really excited about it. Um, and we're excited to help take down more barriers uh, that are preventing people from implementing burns. And so, uh, with this slide, I'll probably repeat a little bit of, of what I've already said, but some of the most common questions I get from folks in Placer County are, I'm a landowner interested in prescribed burning. Um, what resources are available to me? I don't know where to start. And so I would um, first really emphasize our workshops and demonstration burns. We have um, a number of really talented instructors that uh, really help break down prescribed burning for for landowners in, in Placer County. And we've seen the success of that type of education. Um, we also offer technical assistance. So we can um, go on a site visit, walk, a, walk around your property, discuss what type of prep work and mitigation is necessary, um, discuss liability, the number of personnel and equipment um, and management objectives. We also are happy to assist with the permitting process. So a lot of people identify confusion with that. Um, and also help with writing burn plans or discussing what burn plans are. Um, the RCD is also happy to do neighborhood specific presentations. So uh, a lot of my job right now is really emphasizing the outreach and getting the word out that the RCD is here and, and we're here to help. Um, and so I can 
if, if people are interested in having me uh, do a presentation with a Firewise community or something like that, um, please feel free to reach out. Um, and also, so the Placer PBA, which just got off the ground in January and which we're actively trying to get more funding for tools and equipment. Um, being a member of the Placer PBA means that you're first to find out about a lot of these workshops. Um, you have access to the PBA equipment library, which would include things like anywhere from bladder bags to hand tools, to drip torches, to, um, uh, to a water tote um, and a Honda pump. And these are all things that the RCD right now is working on acquiring. So in addition to that, the goal is, uh, is to have um, the Prescribed Burn Association function on its own. So the RCD recognizes that soft money runs out and we are primarily grant funded. Um, we want to uh, essentially mimic the idea of you catch a man a fish, you, you feed him for a day, but if you teach him to fish, um, you feed him for a life. So what we want to do is we want to train landowners how to use prescribed burning so that they don't need us in the future. Um, and what we'd like to emphasize is that we can build, burn a million acres um, and, and achieve that million acre roadmap that the governor identified by training a million landowners to burn one acre. And so we're um, doing the same, it's, it's just like eating an elephant. You just, you eat it one, one at a time. And this feels like an overwhelming problem. Um, but when we start breaking it down and, and giving people and equipping them with the skills and power that they need to, uh, to help, um, people show up and landowners do a great job of doing that. And so I'll say that last year, um, between Placer and Nevada counties, about 100 acres have been successfully burned by landowners. Um, and that's just a really impressive number. So with that, I kind of sped through it. I'm a bit of a fast talker, um, but uh, thank you so much for, for having me speak. I'm happy to address any questions um, and I encourage anybody to reach out to me at the email listed here, cordy at placerrcd.org. If you have more questions, if you need clarification, um, or if you're interested in finding out what else, what other programs the RCD has to offer. Hi, Cordy. Um, thank you very much for that. We do have a few questions. Um, first um, question is, what are the homeowner insurance implications of using prescribed fire? As far as insurance, um, insurance implications, the insurance company is, it is your um, legal right as a California landowner, if you abide by um, the public resources code to put safe fire on the ground. And so the there are no insurance implications. They won't um, fight you uh, or increase your rates if you're using prescribed burns. Um, that said, if you're asking more of a liability question, um, which I'm not sure if, if uh, the participant is, but I can go into that if that's helpful, Rob. Okay, all right. Um, let's see if, uh, if, if uh... We'll get a, um, any clarification on that. In the meantime, another question that came up was, um, uh, what's, what, what's the best way for loan owners to, to get in contact with the RCD for, for workshops and training? And um, maybe if there's a few, uh, if there's anything in regards to related um, programs that the RCD does that you'd like to, uh, to share with us. Yeah, so um, the best way to reach out is uh, either contact me directly via email if email isn't your thing, just call that number um, on the bottom. It's 530-390-6680. Um, and that's just the generic line to the RCD. Um, somebody will answer and direct you to uh, whatever person knows most about the program that's being offered. Um, I also strongly encourage folks to um, log on to the Placer RCD website. It was just revamped. Um, and I can actually put that in the chat if that's helpful. Rob, um, and so the the website used to be very, very janky. Um, and uh, that has been a big thing at the RCD is that like, we look like we don't know what we're doing. Um, and so the website was um, just revamped and it's beautiful. And so um, there are a lot of really good options for landowners that talk about our program offerings. Um, if, you're, if you're interested specifically in the prescribed program, I encourage you to reach out directly uh, to me. 
Okay, great. Also, uh, lastly, the um, earlier I in the chat I put together uh, the the link on the landowners learn to burn um, site. So perhaps if you could say a couple of words about that and what what's uh, what's available there. Yeah, absolutely. So um, thank you for putting that in the chat. That actually um, was a great video that UC Davis put together for us. So um, UC Davis has been um, putting together a crew for fire monitoring and their crew is going around uh, the Sierra foothills around the state actually um, to monitor the benefits of prescribed fire. They reached out to the RCD and they have attended several of our burns. Um, they brought a film crew on one of those burns and they just do a great job of really capturing what the RCD is trying to do. So I encourage folks to watch that video. Um, and it's all about uh, training and training uh, private landowners who have no fire experience whatsoever and, and providing them with the tools and equipping them with the resources to put beneficial fire on the ground. Great. Well, thank you very much, Cordy. I really appreciate the, the time and, and the information here. I'd like to share one, uh, one item here. Uh, to as we close, um, okay. So, in conclusion, our next uh, educational forum will be September 9th, again Friday at noon, and um, our speaker will be Dave Atkinson. Um, so September is National Preparedness Month, and uh, Dave is with the Placer County Office of Emergency Services. I hope he'll be talking about uh, disaster preparedness there, particularly as it pertains to wildfire. Um, if you'd like to stay in touch with the Greater Auburn Area Fire Safe Council, please email us at the address on the screen here and ask to be put on the mailing list. You can also visit our Facebook site, uh, also shown here. Uh, we'll be providing upcoming notices or notices, excuse me, for upcoming sessions through both the mailing list and, and the Facebook group. Um, this presentation, as well as others, will, will be available on YouTube through the Auburn City channel as well. Um, and additionally, we do welcome all to attend our monthly meetings, which are held the third Friday of the month at 9 a.m. At, at Auburn City Hall. Uh, City Hall. Um, with that, thank you, everyone. Um, really appreciate the uh the attendance and um, have a great weekend. Enjoy your day. Also, Rob, real quick. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, mm -hmm. I just added in uh, to a message to you if you wanted to share it with folks that PBS story that I referenced in my presentation, um, just in case folks are interested in seeing it. Okay, great. I will um, make sure we put that in the um, chat for everyone here. And um, also, um, we'll get that out through our, our communication channels as well um, as, as we promote the, uh, um, the recording of this. So, so they'll be able to have access to that information as well. Great. All right. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day.